Hello, people. I'm Jabby Kuei, joined by Acharya the Kirk. Hello. And we're going to look at how this border transformed a subcontinent, India and Pakistan. This is from Vox's YouTube channel. And um, wow, this is going to be uh, an interesting video. The story of how a hastily drawn line divided one people into two. Mm. Who drew that line, Acharya Kirk? Uh, Who drew that line? Uh, it's probably my people's. I'm sorry. I apologize. Okay. Wow, that's pretty. This is the Golden Temple. Oh my god. People come here from all over the world to bathe in its waters, to look at the holy book that is inside of this middle Golden Temple, and to just experience the holiness of this place. Wow. This place is the epicenter of Sikhism. It sits right here in northern India in a city called Amritsar. Close by, there's another important Sikh site called Katarpur. It was established by the founder of Sikhism 500 years ago. It's the place where he spent the last years of his life, and it is the second holiest place in Sikhism. Wow. For centuries, Sikhs have been able to make pilgrimage between these two sites, to move freely throughout their heartland. But in 1947, a British lawyer drew a border here, turning what had been British India into two new countries, India and Pakistan. I can only call it the most sort of bizarre lines which were ever drawn across a map. It went right here, with the Golden Temple on one side and Katarpur on the other. Thanks to this border, Sikhs in India are now cut off from their holy site. Jesus. So many wow. come here to a platform that the Border Patrol set up. Oh, that's so sad. Oh, they can only look at it. You the can platform just look looks at across it. the border, where with the help of telescopes, Sikhs can look at their holy place. Just oh three God, or four kilometers cry. away. In addition to cutting off communities from their sacred sites, this border separated families, cut across rivers, forests, farms, railroad tracks. Today, this border is heavily fortified with nearly all 3,000 plus kilometers fenced. It's lit so well that you can see it from space. Wow. <laughs> and barely anything or anyone crosses over it. Talk about the drawing of the line. What was the most painful was the division of families which took place. And that is a very big reality. This is the story of a violent separation, one of the most traumatic events of the 20th century. It's the story of how a hastily drawn line on a map separated one people into two. And this is a horror story. What we saw was a town soaked with the stench of death. In the train of murder and arson come the refugees. Their suffering is the new tragedy of India. Many will never reach their new land. These are the things that are setting the heart burning on either side of the line. The so sun sad. is setting and I'm walking along one of the oldest roads in Asia, one that used to connect this region. But today, a border runs through it. And instead of connection and trade, what you see here is this. <laughs> wire, there's fences, there are officers everywhere, and yet there's also ice cream and popcorn and paraphernalia. This feels like a sporting event. You can buy keychains of machine guns. Wow. Thousands of spectators file in, filling this stadium that looks down on the border. That's where they do that dance. On the other side, Pakistanis are doing the same. Then, both sides start their different show. Two hours of chanting and dancing.
Then the finale, a face-off between the two sides. Yeah. Oh, wow. They strut back and forth in this coordinated choreography. And it all ends with the lowering of each flag and the closing of this gate. This bizarre border show plays out every evening. But this ceremony, this fence, this intense nationalism, if you rewind just a little in time, none of this existed. The British controlled parts of India for nearly 200 years, but by 1947, a strong movement of independence was swelling across the subcontinent. While back in Britain, the country was in massive debt after fighting World War II and didn't have the resources to hold on to their colony. So they started making plans to leave India. British officials thought that a proper transfer of power would probably take around five years. But when the British leader in charge arrived in early 1947, he hastily decided to shrink their exit timeline. And so what needed five years would now need to be done in just four months. Wow. British India was to be split into two independent nations, a mostly Muslim Pakistan, and a Hindu majority, but officially secular India. To do the actual drawing of the border, the British brought in a lawyer from London. He arrived the month before the British were supposed to leave India. Jesus he Christ. He hadn't been to British India before and didn't know much about the region. He had no idea about India, no idea about Indian geography, no idea about Indian politics. And yet he was the one drawing the lines on the map that would affect millions of lives. That's that? so, so During stupid. Visit, Jesus. This lawyer looked at maps and census data, focusing on the maps that showed religious identity of people in India. India has a wide variety of religions, and based on these census maps, you can see that people of all religions lived amongst each other mm -hmm. all over the region. So to draw the line, the British lawyer looked at individual districts putting any district that had a Muslim majority population into the new country of Pakistan, while Hindu and Sikh majority districts would be kept within India. Based on this method, the lawyer began to see what a border might look like. He only had five weeks to do this. He later wrote that it would have taken years to settle on a proper boundary. And that's because this method of drawing the line conceals that within these districts, there were sizable communities of all religions that had been living side by side for centuries all throughout India. August 15th, 1947, Independence Day for India and Pakistan, but Gandhi is not present. Why the celebration? The British lawyer left that day. He would never return to India again. Two days after independence, the borders were made public, prompting more than 14 million people to leave their homes, their lives, for what was now their side of the border. We were told that you have to cross the border, India. <laughs> Hindus and Sikhs from Pakistan moved into India, and many Muslims in India moved into the new Pakistan. These were people who were indeed forced to uh, lose their entire homes, their memories, their childhood, and the things they saw. It was one of the largest forced migrations of people ever, and it was chaos. A chaos that led to widespread unspeakable violence, cities on fire, sexual violence against women, trains full of dead bodies. The survivors I talked to were just children when all of this happened. The division of the subcontinent became known as the Partition of India, a phrase synonymous with trauma, fueled by the reckless mismanagement of an imperial power. small village right near the border on the Indian side that used to be a Muslim community before partition. And in the middle of
of town is this shrine where residents would conduct ornate Muslim burial practices on these graves. If you look at the original maps that the British drew up when they were trying to draw this line, this town was actually in Pakistan in most of the maps. But in the end, the British lawyer decided to draw the line here. The people here discovered that they were now a part of the new country of India, and so many of them fled just across the border to the new state of Pakistan, and they left this place empty. But just as Muslims were leaving this village for the new Pakistan, Hindus and Sikhs from Pakistan were coming across into India, and some ended up here. <laughs> The Hindus and Sikhs that now live in this community have taken it upon themselves to continue the Muslim traditions that this community was based off of. That's they lovely. continue to maintain these graves and these symbols, even though they don't necessarily pertain to their own religion. This is a sign of respect, of common identity in spite of the border. But this is just one side of the story. The subcontinent echoes and shudders to the sounds of a full-scale, undeclared war. Within just a few months of drawing this border, India and Pakistan were fighting an all-out war. One that centered on this region in the north, which both sides claimed as their own. The new countries would fight several more wars over the years. A border fence would eventually fortify the majority of this boundary, and both countries would acquire nuclear weapons, turning up the tensions and deepening the division. But if you take away the geopolitical bluster, the nukes, the barrier, the trauma of partition, you can still see how much these two countries have in common. I'm at a school in Delhi, Students are Skyping with a school in Pakistan. That's nice. That's really cool. Oh, kids are speaking a similar language, and it takes them just minutes to dive into the common roots of their culture. <laughs> this shared identity that these kids are feeling isn't uncommon in India or Pakistan. Same language, same taste, same food. Whereas Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs used to live together, attend each other's social functions, marriages, everything. Why is this divide now? If you stand in the wall city in Amritsar and you stand in the wall city in Lahore, believe me, the smells, which is a kind of giveaway, are the same. I'm visiting a group of Sikhs coming off the train. They were able to get a visa to go visit this religious site that most have to see through a telescope. So with all these cultural similarities, all these happy faces, shared interests, how do you explain this? You see, it is the politician who poisons people's minds. Hindustan, 
सॉफ्टवेयर एक्सपोर्ट करता है और आपके हुक्मरान टेररिस्टों को एक्सपोर्ट करते हैं द डिवाइड इज क्रिएटेड नर्चर्ड फॉस्टर्ड बिकॉज इट सूट्स अ सर्टेन पॉलिटिक्स Over the years politicians on both sides have exploited tension with the other side to stoke feelings of nationalism. Aur hum usko tez karenge aur pure vishva mein aapko akela rehne ke liye hum majboor karke rahenge. Dono deshon mein nafrat ka kar hai mere leader. Chahe wo Pakistan ke leader ho ya Hindustan ke leader. Ye shanti nahi chahte. Back here at this viewing platform, there's construction vehicles everywhere. For years, the Sikhs have lobbied for easier access to their holy site, and after years, the two governments finally agreed to build a little notch into this border, a corridor that will allow Sikhs to freely access their site without a visa. These four That's kilometers cool. yeah. will restore a small part of what was once the Sikh. A lot of security around that, though. But for millions yeah. of Indians and Pakistanis who continue to live with the repercussions of the traumatic events of 1947, this fortified and volatile border remains unchanged. If anything, it's getting thicker. Seventy years later, the shadow of partition continues to divide families, halt trade, cut connections, stop cooperation, instill fear, promote hatred, and the people who live in its shadow, on both sides, old and young, continue to live with this division that's superimposed upon their history of deep connection. Ah! Yeah, that was oh, God, really damn. that was really emotional. Uh, My mm, God. I'm done. Ah. Uh. Oh, yeah. Goddamn Brits. Yeah, that was a whole messy situation and like obviously I don't know all the history to it, but it seems like had they been able to do it over 5 years or a matter of years as they had intended originally, then maybe something better could have been figured out. I don't know why the timeline changed to 4 months. Uh money. Or maybe that he didn't want to be there, the guy who was in charge of that whole situation. He was like 5 years, eh, 4 months. You know, he just wanted to get out. It's either that like impatience or money. One or the other would inform that. Like why else would you cut the timeline so hard? Why was it so necessary to be so hasty? They brought in a dude who didn't have enough time to like really investigate the situation and and properly draw I don't know line. why they wouldn't have added someone from the Indian side too, but maybe that's just you the know imperialism. the whole imperial yeah. mindset of like we can do it better when really they should have had someone or a team of people who really deeply understood the the country, the yeah. geography and the culture and just kind of been able to give their two cents. A while back, we tried to put out a reaction from AIB with Indians and Pakistanis talking about each other and to each other. Yeah. And I thought it was a very interesting video and I wanted to put it out but like the affiliate company with AIB blocked it and we might do another reaction to it uh, at some point and try to put it out again. It was so long ago. I thought it was a nice video. I'm all about peace. I'm all about like uniting people. I get the tension that exists today and i i get the uh, the vitriol that some people feel even for me this is before the the whole indian thing when i found out that osama bin laden was like just hiding out in pakistan i'm like what there are lots of videos that i don't know how valid or how accurate these videos are that, yeah. that i've watched but they talk about the terrorists that are harbored within Pakistan and how the military it's a military controlled country and then Pakistanis write to me and they're like no that's not true that's all like hysterical media and uh, what do you call it propaganda basically right. you, you know it's it's all lies according to Pakistanis that write into me and I'm like well I don't I don't know what to believe but this is what India's telling me this is what the American media is telling me those are two data points so to speak yeah I mean, i mean i guess the truth is always somewhere in the, in middle. the middle you're right right i just wish that there was a way to patch things up because when you see stuff like this you're reminded that indians and pakistanis are essentially brothers and sisters yeah. like they are from the same family and it's like it's such a deep rooted fight between people that are of the same blood when someone is from a, a wildly different country from your own like let's say america and afghanistan right you know even though we all come from the same primordial soup you go mm -hmm. far back enough You can sort of understand that tension a little bit more. There's not overlapping blood as much. But whereas Indian Pakistan is like, yo, just like 
a grandmother ago. You guys were the same people. Or you still have relatives who, who live back, who in go back Pakistan and, forth. And, and it's like, you can't see them. That's the thing that really distressed me the most and just made me really sad was just watching the news footage of partition. I mean, like when we watched the movie Bharat and we saw that and that was traumatizing. Right, and the that, beginning. That really hit me. And just to watch that like real footage of that happening and hearing firsthand those accounts. It's horrifying to think like, to have to leave your home where like your ancestors grew up and, and you like home is such an important concept, you know, and to then have to be like, oh no, like we don't even have time to pack. You have to go now. Right. And like looking at these old people who are telling these stories and going like, oh, I remember seeing these bloody bodies and like trains full of dead people. They were and kids. They were kids. And yeah. that stays in your mind forever. Yeah. And it's just so disturbing and distressing and just so, so sad. And, and watching the Sikhs be so close to their holy site. They can't. And, even, they can and, only look at it. And yeah, and not be able to go. And it's, and it's like obscured in construction and stuff like that. Yeah. Although I mean, that might have something to do with the uh, little path that they're building. Yeah. Which is positive. I imagine there's going to be so much security around that. It's going to be damn near uncomfortable. That level of security. That's a breach in your wall. Yeah. And you know? like you're trusting people to tell you the truth and right. be like, okay, yeah, I'm definitely seek. It just takes one person yeah. with bad intentions to mess all of that up. To ruin it for everyone. And that's that's what scares me is yeah. that one selfish individual who's going to ruin it for everyone. I don't mean this like in a fun sense, but like ruin the party for everybody. That is really sad. It was very interesting the the, the bit where they were maintaining the temple that isn't in, even of their religion. That was so yeah. beautiful to me. Like I feel like the more I learn about Sikh religion, the level of altruism that right. is so intrinsic in the religion and in the culture, yeah. and the respect for other people who don't necessarily believe the same thing as you, I'm like, wow, like mad love and respect for this religion that champions that. I know that there's a lot of people in our audience who are very, very strong Modi supporters. So please take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. I'll just use America as my jumping off point into this bit in the conversation, but war is profitable. Conflict is profitable. And there is a lot of profit in patriotism. Somehow it's made its way into the zeitgeist that you can't say anything bad about the military here. It's like, everyone's like, oh yeah, you know, and, and praise our troops. Even Colin Kaepernick taking a knee. Right, that was so disrespectful, yeah. right? But even though that was told to him, as far as I know, from a soldier, as a respectful way to protest. Even Bill Burr has called it out. It's like, not all of them are good, <laughs> you know? Some of them are jerks. If you don't praise the military here, you are anti-American. Yeah, you're not a patriot. And so so you'll get outcasted for that kind of talk. And that's just crazy to me. Like we're supposed to be a free country with free speech, but you can't say anything about the military at all. Now I'm in support of people putting their lives on the line and in effort to like maintain my freedoms. Mm -hmm. I totally respect that and, and appreciate that. It's not something I've done. You know, it's other people who are doing it on our behalf. What concerns me is the overlap into extreme patriotism, jingoism, or, yeah. you know, it's like that freaks me out just a little bit because we end up having that, our clubs, you know, our tribes, and it's like, your tribe is bad. Yeah. And then we end up wanting to like murder the other tribe and throw stones at them to knock them out. You know, it's like, that freaks me out a little bit. I get shit from Pakistani fans sometimes just because like of the things that I believe Pakistan is doing. Maybe I'm wrong. I just feel like there's a lot of weird shit going on over there. And maybe it would have been different if the Brits handled that differently. If they handled it with a little bit more patience and diligence, like they, they basically ran the fucking place for 200 years and they're just gonna up and leave overnight. That's yeah. really stupid. Like that's inconsiderate to the people who you've basically been hemorrhaging for all their resources and pillaging them. It's like yeah, and I'm not, I'm not sure why exactly they decided to do the two countries. I I seem to it had to do with the leaders something it, about like they wanted two separate leaders. It was it had to do if I'm not mistaken, it had to do with Gandhi. Yeah, and he was approached by Muslim leaders, and they said they wanted their own territory. So they somehow made a deal for the Muslims to have their own area. The way that was all divided was retarded because like there was East and West Pakistan. It's like, you're just trying to make this awful. That's why the other Pakistan became, what was it? It became Bangladesh? Bangladesh, it's yeah. It's like, what are you doing? Yeah. The country is separated by a wide area of land. Yeah. It's so strange to me that this one dude made this decision and then millions and millions of people have to deal with the repercussions of yeah. that. 
and no one can fix this. The one glimmer of hope that I really enjoyed with this documentary, when they showed the children from New Delhi and Lahore talking having to each other. the conversation, or that like, yeah. that melted my heart because they're so innocent, right? They have a lot of curiosity and this great capacity for love and acceptance. And I think it's really great that the schools are like reaching out in that way and teaching the children like, hey, you know, we're not that different after all. Look at how much we have in common. Like see them, hear yeah. them, talk to them, show them your food and your culture. And yeah. we're literally just brothers and sisters. It's an effort to instill empathy before the rest of the world gets its hands on your mind. Yeah. On, on these innocent, malleable minds, because that's what will happen. Between stuff that's put out on YouTube and the news and whatnot, a lot of information is thrown your way and they're just gobbling it up, like a soaking it up like a sponge. Yeah. Because they're like a fresh hard drive with information to just dump on them. Mm -hmm. And so it's great that these teachers are doing that. I wish that there were more programs in place to continue that stuff into adulthood so that people maintain that empathy for one another. Even um, I was on the live stream that you were helping out with. I was just randomly talking to fans who were chatting with us. I was <clears throat> doing uh, YouTube and Instagram at the same time, YouTube Live, Instagram Live, so that people from YouTube Live could do a face chat with me on Instagram that everyone could watch. And one of them was a Pakistani dude who lives in like Chicago or something like that. Mm -hmm. And immediately, someone in the comments was like, get this Pakistani off of here. It's like, He's a nice guy. He's yeah. not even doing anything wrong. He's a fan of Indian movies. Like, don't you want Indian movies to be loved everywhere? Like, why do you have such an issue with this guy who has nothing to do with any of the problems that you've experienced from Pakistanis? So it's just interesting, like that kind of deep rooted vitriol. Mm -hmm. I do hope that there's a way someday that there's more unity, you know, yeah. and, and less vitriol, but one can only hope.